You're listening to the Business Mike Podcast. Amazing interviews with entrepreneurs and industry thought leaders. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Business Mike Podcast. And joining me today is Dr. Emmanuel Wanyonganise. Dr. Emmanuel, welcome to the show. And can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Uh, thank you for having me, Dawood. I'm excited to be here. Um, as we said earlier, I'm long overdue, but I'm happy we're here now. Um, so my name is Emmanuel. Emmanuel Manyonga Nisa, you pronounce it uh, very well. And I currently work in, in Saudi Arabia. I work as a customer experience strategy advisor. Um, I work with the CMO, CXO, basically the, the C-suite. I, my background is consulting. I did quite a lot of work in telcos and currently now in, in banking. And, and basically my, my objective is to, to help organizations to make customers um, spend more and make customers stay with them and make customers talk about them to their friends and their family. And to do this, they just have to provide exceptional customer experience, which is the topic of this podcast today. Right now, you mentioned you're working in Saudi Arabia, and certainly different countries have different levels of CX maturity. So what would you say is the CX maturity of uh, a place like Saudi Arabia? Absolutely right. Um, different countries and also different industries in some cases have different levels of customer experience maturity. Um, Saudi Arabia, it's growing exponentially in terms of interest and practice of customer experience. Um, I see it everywhere. So recently we celebrated the CX Day and there were CX events all over the place, even in my own company in the Bank of Bilad, we had a CX Day which we celebrated. So if you are looking across the globe, uh, you'd say Saudi is somewhere up there with the rest of the, the organizations or the countries which are leading in terms of developing customer experience and practicing it. Yes, and that brings me to the first question I wanted to ask you, which is about CX maturity, because having a well-defined CX strategy, it's crucial for you to achieve the level of maturity that you want. You can't get there without a well-defined CX strategy. And I wanted you to speak more on that and how your experience has unraveled in that particular lane of, of having a CX strategy that ultimately defines where your maturity uh, ends up as, a, as an organization. Just, just speak to us about that element. Okay, so yeah, I like the way you connected the two, the CX strategy and the maturity, because you will see maybe later on in, in, in this conversation how they, they, they link closely. But let me let me start by identifying the key elements of a strategy, which are, number one, it's, you know, where do you want to play? So here we're talking about the scope of your products and services. And the second thing is your smart objective, your specific and measurable objectives that you want to achieve. And the third key element of a strategy is how do you win? So your competitive advantage, basically. And um, by that rough definition, Having a CX strategy, it means that you are mapping the direction of all the CX activities that you're going to do that year or in the next five years or in the next 10 years. And, and to answer you maybe in a more practical way, having a CX strategy, what it does is, I'll give you three things. So one, it establishes the CX as a core business function. So instead of having CX as a supporting function where other departments or other functions, they dictate what CX does, if you have a CX strategy, it means that you CX is actually a core component of the business. It means you drive the narrative of what CX does. You decide which activities and actions and initiatives that you do. The second thing that a CX strategy will help you with is that it will help you to approach customer experience with a holistic view. So now if we go back to your question about maturity assessment, so to have a CX strategy, you need to understand where you are. And where you are, you need to do a maturity assessment. So you are basically looking at all aspects of customer experience competencies. So it could be culture and competencies, uh, sorry, culture and accountability. It could be insights and measurements. 
or it could just be tools and, and, and technology. So you have to look at all the CX competencies to do a maturity assessment. And once you understand that, and you look at also where you want to go. So if you go back to the key elements of strategies, where you want to go, what you're trying to achieve, and then you assess the gap between where you are after maturity assessment and where you want to be, and you identify the gaps. And after you identify the gaps, then you're able to define the key initiatives that you want to do to fill in the gaps. You are able to prioritize those initiatives to fill the gaps. So in a nutshell, having a CX strategy, the importance is it, one, it allows you to establish CX as a core business function. Number two, it allows you to look at CX from a holistic view. And the third thing is that um, it's a communication tool. So this is quite interesting because CX is not always very understood across the organization, including senior management. So having a CX strategy allows you to go to the senior management to knock at the door of the chief technology officer or chief finance officer and say, hey, look, I just want to share with you what we are doing in customer experience. Um, I want to see if that aligns with your strategy. So you start talking to them about your customer experience strategy. And at best, what you will do is you actually get support and buy in about your CX strategy. The least you will get out of it is that you will be able to educate them about customer experience. So I think I've quickly highlighted the three sort of practical reasons why you need to have a CX strategy and how that also links to maturity asset, to, custom, to CX maturity. Yeah, I believe you've demonstrated that well. And I must say there's a, an event I attended as a marketer where we were being sensitized about ESG in particular. And what struck me was that ESG and sustainability in general is coming to the forefront of business strategies in general. So you can't have a business strategy without sustainability. And in Uganda, where I am, we started a, a customer experience association. It's less than a year old, it's very young. And one of our key objectives is to have, just like sustainability is at the forefront, we want CX as well to be at the forefront of business strategies when they're being drafted and have someone that is representing CX sat on the table of decision makers at the C-suite and places like that. And that brings me to the question why I wanted to find out from you and from your experience, what is the necessity of aligning CX strategies with the broader business objectives to ensure that uh, you have a cohesive an impactful approach, just like we're looking at sustainability, ESG, CX, as you and I and most listeners of this program, because they are CX professionals, know it's important. But can you elucidate on that significance of, of the importance of aligning your strategies with the broader business objectives? Yeah, so that's um, actually a very, very important topic and it, it's something that within the, the CX um, community, we, we talk about a lot. So ideally you want customer experience to be part of the corporate strategy, right? So um, if you remember when I spoke about the three key elements, one of them is how do you win? So ideally you want the organization to be able to say, you know what, we are going to grow so much revenue or we're gonna increase our market share. But how do we do that? Is by delivering exceptional customer experience. Or how do we do that? Is by putting the customer first. So you do want that, that customer experience to be really part of that corporate, corporate um, strategy, which is the, the business objectives. In a case where somehow it's not the case, yeah? so you have a corporate strategy and it's not really talking directly about customer experience, it's still, quite important to make sure that that CX strategy is aligned to the wider corporate strategy. And three reasons for that is that number one, if you are aligned to the corporate strategy, it means that we are actually helping the business to achieve its objectives, which is what we really are, right? Customer experience is not just something that sits alone on the side. It's we are there to help the business to achieve its objectives. So if we align the CX strategy to the corporate strategy, it means we, we are helping the business. The second point is, if you have your CX strategy aligned to the corporate strategy, you will be viewed as a team player. 
right? The, instead of doing your own thing, you are aligning to the corporate strategy. You are seen as a team player that helps you to build credibility, that helps you to, um, to be trusted because you are aligning with the organization. The third thing is, if you align your CX strategy to the corporate strategy, it means that the roadmap or the initiatives and, and, and projects that you, def, that you define under CX, they are already automatically aligned to the corporate strategy. So you will find that instead of your projects or initiatives being discoped or deprioritized, they will be prioritized. They will be in scope. There will be a budget for your projects. There will be resources for your projects. Why? Because your projects are aligned to the, to the corporate strategy. So that kind of helps you to, to actually, in the end, you know, we, for CX, we are there to really help the business. And we need to make sure that our CX strategy is aligned to the corporate strategy. And if it's possible, let's make sure that it's actually at the core of the strategy itself, as you explained earlier. Yes, I just want to follow up your answer with a quick question, particularly in terms of making a case for CX, because CX is usually put at the back. Are there any examples you've seen or read, or maybe personal experiences that you have where you highlight to the board or C-suite the significance of having CX at the forefront? Are there any, any ways you can package CX as being vital to the business that can maybe help someone out there listening who doesn't quite know how to phrase the importance of CX to these people up there who prioritize marketing, finance, and so on. Yes, so that's that's been, um, I think, recorded or reported as one of the biggest challenges of customer experience practitioners. It's how do you convince the the C-suite, the senior management, to prioritize CX. How do you show them the importance of CX? And then and, and the answer is usually, you know, show them the return on investment. So there's been some research. Um, I know Forrester did some research, Katna did some research to show that um, if you increase customer experience by one point, this is how much revenue you will increase. So you can always uh, do that um, if you want, uh, you know, something credible because some of these are sort of research that has been done is by credible companies like Forrester and Gartner. So you can always do that. You can find some material related to that. One thing I always um, try to do and one thing that I find very convincing, even convincing myself, is to really look at, um, to try to help to define what is customer experience and who is responsible for customer experience, right? So when it's, in most cases, you'll find that in the organization, senior management will say, oh, wow, you guys in customer experience, why don't you fix the problems, right? And what I try to do is to show them, I work in banking right now. I show them the product life cycle, what we do in banking to make money. So in their view is we start with an idea, we develop a product, we sell the product, we do the marketing, and then the customer buys it. And my question is, okay, at that point in time, during this whole experience, where, who is really responsible for enhancing the experience or messing up the experience? So at this point in time, the customer experience team hasn't been involved yet, right? It's sales and marketing, it's uh, product development, it's IT, it's project management. All this time, customer experiences and customer experience team has not been involved yet. So showing them that the actual people who are really responsible for the customer experience is all these other teams before the product is ready. And then let's look at the customer experience team or the, it could be the complaints team or the customer engagement team. So these are the guys who then deal with the customer when the customer is angry. At that point in time, these guys can either make the customer stay or make the customers leave. And what I do at that point in time is try to show them that these guys are the ones who are actually generating revenue by making the customer stay. Otherwise, if they do it wrong, the customer will leave. So in that case, I try to show them that customer experience is not just about what is done by the customer experience team. It's something that we build into our product development. That's something that the whole organization does. And therefore, is it important or is it not important? then it's important. Um, 
quickly on that one, the other thing I also do is look at what happens when a customer is not satisfied, right? So a customer will call three times and then will complain. If it's in Saudi Arabia, there's an organization called Central Bank, then the customer will compl complain to the Central Bank. So the customer has called us five, six, seven times. That costs us. That's a cost to us. Now, the customer, once they, are, once they complain, they have to tell all their friends, about three, four, five friends, about the bad experience they had. That means the customer is not only detracting, but becomes an advocate of bad experience. That means our cost to acquire new customers becomes very high. So again, is customer experience good or bad? It has to be good because if we do provide customer experience, the opposite happens. The customer will spend more with us because they like us. The customer will stay with us longer. The customer will tell their friends about us. So advocate, they will tell five, 10 people about the good experience they have. The cost to acquire those customers is pretty much nothing. It's like the customer is working as your marketing department. So being able to show them the two sides of what happens with a good experience, what happens with bad experience, sometimes it starts making them think a little bit and make them realize that, yes, customer experience is important. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to add to that, I, I wanted to now dive into personalization. I remember earlier this year I received a mail from an organization that referred to me as Dear Sir or Madam. They, they didn't even know what my sex was. And yet those are some of the fundamentals that they ask for when you're filling out your KYC. So yeah. I wanted to appreciate from your point of view, the importance of personalization and, and customer segmentation whilst drafting these strategies that will ultimately, as you had mentioned, number one, be in, embedded and incorporated in the overall business strategy and also help us to ultimately achieve the maturity that we are looking for as an organization. But what role in particular does personalization and, and segmentation play in all that? Wow. So personalization is it's a big topic. So we, we might need to arrange another podcast, another episode just to talk about personalization. It's really big, but it's also critical, especially these days people are talking about it, even hyper-personalization to some extent. Um, but let's, let's see what, how much we can cover today, right? So um, one way of describing great experience, it's, it's, you know, creating a positive emotional engagement, how you make someone feel. That's one way of describing great customer experience. And there is no, nothing more effective than being able to, um, you know, your service provider being able to, when you walk in, they acknowledge you by name. Like, hi, Dodd, thank you for coming. Or they just give you your favorite coffee as soon as you walk in. Or they just acknowledge that you come back inside. And it just makes the customer feel seen. It makes them feel valued. Uh, it makes them feel appreciated. I'm a gold member for Emirates. So whenever I fly Emirates Airlines, um, one of the cabin crew or the head of cabin crew, he comes to me. He says, welcome back, Dr. Emmanuel. It's good to have you back. If you need anything, um, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, I never really ask anything more than anybody else, but it just feels good and it makes me want to come back. So, you know, personalization is, it's, doesn't stop there. So this is just the basic part of it. Um, but it goes beyond that. It goes to tailoring and personalizing the products and services that we offer to customers. Like you're saying, you know me, like they, they say to you, DSA or madam, right? You'd expect them to know you. And then you kind of question if they're going to offer you a product or a service. Do they really know what product to offer you for, for, for a man or for a woman? But they, they, they don't know. So if we are able to start tailoring products and services to customers based on their preferences, based on their behavior, then we start really doing personalization, right? So... I've worked in telco, for example. So whenever I travel, my service provider, they even know which country I'm traveling in. Um, and my bank, when I travel, they even know how much I'm spending, right? So if I fly to Johannesburg in South Africa frequently, I'd expect an offer about, I don't know, a hotel in South Africa. I'd expect an offer about a discounted um, mobile telephone tariff in South Africa. 
So that's really personalizing products. But also the part that I'm really getting into these days is personalizing customer service. Um, you know, when the customer needs something, when, when I've reported my card lost or stolen, you know, I expect when I call that someone is ready and say, oh yeah, we understood that you reported your card lost or stolen. By the way, we have ordered the replacement. We just need you to tell us where to deliver it. That's service. So that's, that's, that's personalization. So it's not just, you know, knowing my name, but it's also understanding the context of what's really happening to me at the time. Um, if I'm a customer for a TV provider, right? If I pay my television um, before the due date, I don't care about getting a notification that I've paid. If I paid, let's say, just an hour before the due date, I really want to know that you have received my money because I don't want my services to be cut off. Mm -hmm. If I pay after I've already been cut off, I really want to know immediately that you've received my money and you're going to reconnect me. So it's bringing in context here. So personalization is knowing the context, knowing the, the person, um, knowing their preferences and their behavior. And really, you know, we can extend that to, start to, to, to talk about um, predicting a customer's behavior, uh, anticipating their needs based on their preferences and their behavior as well, and being able to proactively actually meet them before they ask for them. And that's where I see, you know, customer experience is really going, especially when you start talking about AI um, and hyper-personalization. I see that that's where it's really going to be able to say, hey, Emmanuel, you know, you're likely going to be traveling um, in December and you think you might need this and you like traveling maybe to this part of the world, you think you might need this. And then and, and that's where I think we're really going. And I, like I said, maybe we'll need to have another session where we talk about hyper-personalization, especially with the help of AI. Yeah, absolutely. I have a, a wild theory that down the line, many years from now, there'll come a time when you have to pay extra to talk to a person. I think that's how far this AI thing will go. It will get to a point whereby you just, are you willing to pay a lot of money just to speak to a fellow human being in service delivery? Uh, Dr. Emmanuel, we're recording this episode during the customer experience week and i just wanted to find out from you as someone that's been in this profession for some time what is it about what we do as cx practitioners that that excites you the most just something for us to hang on to as we go through this special week of customer experience oh wow that's that's a that's a tough question um but right now it will be a long the same topic we are covering now. Um, it's, it's, you know, I was talking about to offer a person really, you know, hyper-personalized services, you really have to know them. You really have to know a person in the same way that human beings know each other, right? If you know me very, very well, you will know that, um, let's say you know me at work and you know that Emmanuel is late. He probably needs coffee and he probably uh, needs his parking to be sorted. If you know me that well, you are able to anticipate and then be able to meet my, my needs. And I see uh, slightly different from your view uh, that will need uh, people, but I, I see that AI will be able to help people to provide that kind of service where we really, really know our customers. Like really, we understand the context and we understand their preferences, we understand what they need and use all that information, all of it, to actually provide the services that the customers need. And that, that's, for me, that's really exciting. And I think AI will be able to, to allow us to do that because with so much data that we have and AI can process that data. And in some cases, it can even be more accurate than human beings and it's faster than human beings. Um, I think with all that, for me, it, I'm really looking forward to that. And I think it, it's, it's gonna happen. Um, I don't know if you watch Suits, do you watch, uh, you know, the... I series? know of Suits. I know it's about lawyers, but I have not watched it, no. Okay, so there is one episode where Harvey, the, the main guy, he's, he walks into the office and he is late and he says to Jonah, he's about to tell Jonah, his secretary, that he needs coffee, but Jonah already has coffee held in her hand. So he says, Jonah, I need... And then she's got the coffee already. 
and then said, oh, but also I forgot to buy. She said, I've already bought the flowers for your mom because I've already, I knew that it's, um, it's a birthday. And then he says kind of like, oh, will you marry me? And said, oh, we got married seven years ago. You just didn't know, you just didn't know about it. it it's, it's that kind of knowing a person so well that I'm looking forward to that we can be able to do in customer experience. Wow, what a fantastic way to end the interview. Dr. Emmanuel, I can't thank you enough for joining us today on the Business My Podcast and sharing your wonderful insights. In case anyone wants to get in touch with you, learn more about what you do, where can they find you on the internet? Uh, maybe on LinkedIn, if you have a website or social media, or whatever it is that you have available. How can people get in touch with you? I would say LinkedIn is probably the best um, medium to, to, to connect, connect with me. So it's Emmanuel Manyonganise. Um, if uh, you're watching this video, so you might be able to see my name here. But yeah, it's, uh, just connect with me on, um, on LinkedIn and we'll take it from there. All right. Well, Dr. Emmanuel, thanks again for coming on the show. And uh, I wish you a wonderful 2024 and an even better 2025. All the best. It was my pleasure. It was great talking to you as well. And I wish you all the best.